starts listing 20 years doing this and 24 years doing this, I think I am getting old. Um, several years ago, it was a uh, really cold morning in uh, Milwaukee, and I had an early flight, and it was overcast in the middle of the winter. And as I made um, my way to through the plane back to uh, my seat, I noticed that sitting next to my assigned seat was this little girl about eight or nine years old. And I asked her just to make sure she wasn't too nervous about it, if I could sit next to her, like she really had a choice. But um, and she said that would be fine. So I sat down and uh, she then tapped me on the sh shoulder and she said, Mister, she said, um, would you be willing to be my partner? Well, not quite sure what that meant in her mind. Uh, I said, sure. And she said, well, great. She said, my mother said that on the on the flight, I needed a partner in case something happened on the plane. They could help me out. So we, I'm sorry, is this? Is your mic on? on? Well, the green light is. Okay. Davis, is there a way to turn it up at all? Uh, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, you said that so you said that somewhere. Okay, so I'll talk louder, maybe. Can you not hear me? It's on. Davis, go check. Oh, maybe the system is not on. Davis, did you turn the system on? What? Or no? Maybe she is. Okay, Tammy has had it. Sorry, but thanks for letting us know. Yeah. The connection has failed. Oh. Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay. There we go. Is this better? Is this any better? No, not any better. Okay, so let me uh, let me try to project a little bit stronger. Sir? I can hear you just fine. Maybe, maybe they all need to sit at this table, right? Uh, but what we agreed with um, is that as we were going along on this journey, we would be each other's partner. And as I reflected upon that, um, and, and thankfully, there were no uh, emergencies, nothing that I had to go into place with that. But I, but I reflected on that and realized that that is, in, a, in and of itself, some generosity. Father Perry's got to be correct for us. Uh, and so, uh, generosity is, is, as we'll talk about here in a minute, is much more than just um, uh, dealing with money. It's also who we are. It's really um, a lifestyle in which we want to incorporate. Um, I've labeled this talk, uh, From Here to Generosity, Beyond Ourselves. So I think it's really important that we begin with, when we say from here, from where is here? Well, for, for many people, uh, for a lot of people actually, uh, we start with the mindset of scarcity. That is the almost um, uh, a default position that most of us go to when, whenever we begin to do that. So we're going to talk about going from scarcity to abundance to generosity. Is you, you still having a hard time hearing? So, yeah. If you can speak up, I'm going to um, I'm going to go try and do something in the back end of the system to get it to work. So you might pop on at some point. Okay. <laughs> my uh, my radio does that a lot. Um, uh, so, let me see if I can project a little bit better here. Um, so, scarcity is um, a mindset is, is, is that when you are so obsessed with a lack of something, usually time or money, that you can't seem to focus on anything else, no matter how hard you try. Stephen Covey says that with a scarcity mentality, you compete for resources even when there is an abundance of them. Oftentimes, fear of the unknown can use can cause us to think uh, with a scarcity mindset. The most powerful form of scarcity is, is demand when the desired item is available, and we become frightened as a result of the demand for this thing. We can probably all relate to toilet paper. Right? Uh, so we want to be able to get out of that kind of mindset of the, the world's coming to an end, I have to keep everything close to me and there's nothing that I can give away. There's no time or talent or resources, financial resources that I can 
I have to have all that to myself. So to be able to move into a mindset of abundance, uh, which means overflowing or full or plenty, um, in order to do that, I would suggest five things. One is focus on what you have rather than what you do not have. Surround yourself with people that have an abundant mindset. Um, that type of um, peer pressure it is a positive type of peer pressure that we have. Create win-win solutions rather than win-lose solutions. And in, in our world, that's kind of, you know, I'm going to win at your expense. And what we're wanting to do is I can win and you can win as well. Uh, incorporate gratitude in your life. Be thankful for, for what you do have and, and to be able to express that. And train your mind to recognize the possibilities, the possibilities that are out there beyond rather than, you know, what are, what are my limitations? Um, we're generous because God was first generous to us, freely giving His life for our sakes. As followers of Christ, we seek to imitate the one who gave Himself for us. And that's from uh, 1 Thessalonians, the sixth chapter. Uh, generosity at its core is a lifestyle, a lifestyle in which we share all that we have or and ever will become as a demonstration of God's love and our response to His grace. Several years ago, um, I was training for a marathon. I am not a good runner, but marathons, you don't have to be good runners, you just have to get to the end. <laughs> and, uh, and this was in New York City, this was the New York City Marathon, and you have to qualify for that, or you can enter in a lottery. I've never entered the lottery except for that one, and, and I did get in. I couldn't, I uh, always figured I was going to have to keep running until I was about 100 in order for my, and keep the same time in order for me to qualify. Um, and so, uh, to show you how, how slow of a runner I was, um, my wife Judy and, and another friend, they were at the, uh, at the finish line, which was in uh, Central Park. And they were having brunch there, they were watching all these people come in, and after the race, after I staggered in and, and everything, uh, she began to tell me about some of the people who came before me. Like the couple who, upon rounding the corner, and you could see the finish line, and they were holding hands, but the woman was really struggling, her eyes were closed, and the man said, please open your eyes, look what's ahead. And she could see the finish line, and they ran in. Yes, a man dragging his wife in the race. <laughs> or, the, um, or the two guys who were in a costume, a donkey costume. <laughs> yeah, they beat me too. <laughs> so, so out of that, I learned I, I'm really not a very good runner. Um, but there were some things that I learned in, in, uh, as I went through that process and training for that, and, I, and the benefits that came from that training. And one of them dealt in the area of my, uh, of my diet and being able to, to physically get into a position where I could at least finish this. And so in, in doing some research and working through that, one of the concepts that I learned is what is called empty calories. Now, empty calories are things that we consume that have no nutritional value. And there's a lot of things uh, in most of our diets that would uh, be involved with that. Um, and that is part of the problem of, of, of the health of in, within our country is that a lot of people because it is uh, a cheap uh, uh, form of, of food, will we'll eat these empty calories, and because of that, obesity is at about 30% uh, of our population. Uh, overweight is an additional 34%. Uh, diabetes, things we... Well, <laughs> that, that's, that's what happens uh, to my car radio. All of a sudden, it just pops 
Thank you. Better, right? Yeah, good. I can even hear me now. Uh, and, and so, so I learned uh, as I went through that, that in order to be able to have a healthier diet, there were some things that I was going to have to eliminate from my uh, diet that I did love. And there were going to be some things that I was going to have to add to my diet that previously I thought were uh, not desirable. Um, and so it was a slow process of weeding out the things that were uh, that were empty calories and adding the things that were much more nutritious. Well, I looked at that and realized that that happens not only within our physical being, but also within our spiritual being and in our emotional being as well with that. And so part of that is then I began to apply that into the area of generosity. And um, give me just a minute here. Let's switch over. And there we go. Um, John Wesley uh, provides some insight into the subject when he stated that you are to earn all that you can, which he uh, defined as honest hard work, save all that you can, which he defined as spend as little on yourself as you can in order to give all that you can. Yeah, one of the things I learned about John Wesley was that as, um, as he began his, uh, his ministry and his work, that he started off with a certain salary, and that as the years progressed, he kept that same salary. Uh, oh, excuse me, no, as the years progressed, his salary increased, but he continued to live on what he was doing back many years before, so that it enabled him to be able to give away more and more. Now, a, uh, in other words, he was saying that the main objective in life is, is to be generous. He went on to encourage Christians to live simply, without opulence, avoiding the waste of money on things unnecessary. Sounds like my father-in-law. He believed Christians are to live a life of self-control, self-restraint, and self-denial. He thought that such practices deepened faith, avoided pride and vanity, and resulted in a greater capacity to help others, which was his objective. Martin Luther, different uh, uh, denomination over there, uh, stated that a Christian is to remember that the proper use and place of money, it should be used to alleviate the sufferings of the poor. He went on to say that what Christians do with their money is indicative of what they believe in God. Now, if we take that, that statement and, and think about that and apply it to our lives and, and spend some time doing an inventory of how we spend our money, and an, an interesting uh, practice could, or exercise could be just uh, over a month and with your budget and how you spend your money, look at that and then with a mindset of then how does that reflect my relationship with God? How am I using my money uh, in, in my and how does that re reflect my relationship with God? Um, Luther also said that God's economy is one of grace rather than reciprocity. Jesus did not counsel his followers to give only to the worthy poor, but to all who ask for help. Um, Luther also states that not all wealth is the same. God created material goods for the benefit of humankind, but wealth is not to be pursued for its own sake. So we are encouraged to live simply, without opulence, avoid the waste of things unnecessary. Um, during the first decade of this century, uh, consumers within America were purchasing with money that they did not have. Buying on credit was an, at an all-time high. 40% um, of the American people spent 110% of their annual income each year. Today's 
consumerist culture causes Americans to focus on what they do not have. And we think about all the marketing that goes out there and the things that you have, that you need to have, and because of this you're going to be, uh, you're going to have shinier teeth, so having shinier teeth is going to make you uh, more, well, and who knows now, right? I'm looking at all you with masks. <laughs> you may or may not have shinier teeth. Uh, uh, so to, today's consumerist culture causes America, as I said, uh, to focus on what they do not have. Mass consumerism is the greatest rival to generous living because it's saying that's how you need to use your resources. In Luke 19, we find the story of the nobleman who was going to leave his servants uh, money and was going off to a foreign land so that they would have the freedom to be able to use it as they wish. And if you remember that story that some of them invested in, they did various things, and when he came back, they talked about how it was used. But the one that got into trouble was the one who buried his, kept it away with that. So I've often wondered about that. That seems like, well, okay, I'm not going to waste the money. I'm going to keep it over here. I'm not going to spend it frivolously or anything. But he's the one that got scolded in, in the story. And I was reading recently uh, a, a different view of that, of why was that person looked at being in the wrong. And this particular writer said that he claimed it was his right to the money but he shows no responsibility for its use. When we balance the two, money can do a great deal of good. So the resources that we have, the lesson was the resources that we have, regardless of how much they are, it's what we do with them uh, it is the important thing. So just putting it away and not helping other people or not investing it into ministries is... Uh, is the negative side of that story. At its core, core as we had said earlier, generosity is really is a, is a lifestyle. Um, it's not about what you have, rather it's about who you are. It's not dependent on how much you have, but rather how much you're willing to give out of what you have. And we, I think, uh, oftentimes use the excuse as I, I don't have very much money, so how can I be generous? And generosity is really measured not so much as it, I just said, on how much you're going to give away, but it's basically out of what I have, how much can I, can I give? Um, we, are, we aren't, why we aren't generous has a lot to do about our self-worth. Society has convinced us that our worth is measured in possessions. So the bigger the car, I can, I can remember several years ago, my, my son, he was college age, and he was at a place down in Dallas uh, uh, where a lot of people his age uh, would hang out. And he said one of the things that he noticed was when they would get there, they would all put their keys out onto the bar, on the table where they are, to be able to show what kind of car that they had. Because that was their self-identity, that if I, if I have this kind of car, then, my, then I'm worthy, I'm, I'm an important person as, as a result of that. Um, when uh, David, David Ramsey said, we buy things that we don't need, with money that we don't have to impress people that we don't know. In a survey, it was asked, how much more income would it take for you to be happy? The average person said 20% more. Regardless of how much they had, it was always 20% more. There's a little thin book called The Millionaire Next Door, and one of the interesting things was in, in that particular study, they, uh, in order to be a part of that, uh, a person had to have a net worth of $10 million, so we're talking very wealthy people. And when they would talk with them, they said, when will you feel comfortable, when will you feel confident that you have enough? And it was always when I have 20% more, 
regardless. If, I, if they had a million dollars, if they had $20 million, if they had $100 million, it was always, we needed a little bit more. So that mindset of, I need more, I need more, I need more, goes counter to what we are, uh, to, to a mindset that allows us to be generous because we think that we just need to keep hoarding it and keep it in, in, in our pile. Um, a philosophy, uh, excuse me, at, at root, these are spiritual problems, not just merely financial planning issues. They reveal value systems that are spiritually corrosive, that lead to uh, continuing discontent, discouragement, and unhappiness. Um, and and you, you know, we've all observed this in, uh, through, through the years, and we see people who you would think just have the perfect life going on. They have all the material possessions in the world that they need, and yet the unhappiness that, uh, that, that sometimes is, is unveiled within their life. A, a philosophy based upon, based principally upon materialism, acquisitions, and possessions is not sufficient to live by or even to die by. At some point, we must decide whether to listen to the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of God. God's eternal uh, love revealed is the source, uh, excuse me, God's eternal love revealed in Christ is the source of self-worth. True happiness, meaning, or found in growing in grace and the knowledge and love of God. Giving generously repri reprioritizes our lives and helps people to be able to distinguish between what is lasting, what is eternal, and is of infinite value from what is temporary or trustworthy. We find it harder to be generous because our society values shape our perceptions more than our faith values do. Because we're constantly bombarded. I can remember 20 years ago, and, and, and uh, an example I used to use is when I would get my utility bill, my electric bill, and it was an envelope, and there was a bill, and then there was like three or four other things in there of how I could spend my money and doing all that, and we would talk about you know, how we were bombarded with, uh, with all this information. Well, that was when the internet was just kind of getting going, and that was before we had social media, and so we could just multiply that by like a million times. Of all the things that we're bombarded with, we look up something online, and then all of a sudden, those ads come your way. Like, okay, I didn't really want to know about that. Uh, and, uh, and so we're constantly being bombarded more and more with that of how to use our money for other things. And so it does, it does take uh, discipline in our life to be able to do that. Discipline is something that we're not always fond to do. And one of the things that, that helped me um, in, in that area was the statement that says, discipline without a direction is drudgery. So once we have a direction that we're going to, once we have a goal that we're striving toward, then it does help with the discipline. Back to my, my running, to be able to do some of the things in my diet and stuff, because I have a goal of being able to at least finish the race, um, was, was a goal that helped me to be able to, to, to keep that particular discipline. Um, Where do Christians stand in the, today in the area of, of generosity? So you can compare this to, to your own life. 20% of Christians give nothing compared to 50% of non-Christians. So we're doing better, there, right? The average Christian gives 2.9% of their income. While those who attend church at least twice a month give 6.2%. So obviously the more you're involved in church, the more that you see the needs the more you're growing in your spiritual life, then that becomes reflective in how, um, how you're generous. Um, ways that we can become more generous, there are, there are, there's research that's been done on this, and so these are, uh, 
these particular points come out of research uh, and uh, that were tested. And so here are some of the benefits to being generous, which when I read them, I was, was really surprised. The first one is generosity makes us healthy. Research has found that it actually reduced blood pressure as much as medicine and exercise. So give them a whole lot of money and you're going to be well, right? Well, that's not <laughs> I think we've heard that guy on television before. Um, so that's not what it's saying, but it is talking about, the, about a generosity lifestyle and, and thinking of others more than thinking of, of ourselves. But it also uh, lowers the risk of dementia, reduces anxiety and depression. Again, because we're taking the focus off what we don't have and being thankful for what we do have, taking the focus off of who we are and focusing it on others and how we can help them. Generosity makes us happy. It actually giving triggers feel-good chemicals like endorphins and dopamine within our lives. Generosity lowers stress. Being stingy raises our stress levels. I didn't realize that. Generosity extends our lives. Now this is this I thought was pretty interesting. During one study, subjects that volunteered for two or more causes had a 63% lower rate of mortality than people who didn't volunteer during the study. So volunteer, you know, like if you do 10 things, then you don't die, maybe. Um, you know, it's just saying that you're, you're going to have a healthier uh, overall life and, um, and you're going to have the percentages more in your, in your favor at that point. So embrace gratitude. Make a list of things in your life which you're grateful for. And so that's an exercise that I would encourage you to do, just to spend a minute or so uh, or longer than that, and begin to uh, write down some things that that are that you have in your life that you're thankful for. Again, switching it from the mindset of what I don't have, I wish I had, if I could only have, to I'm thankful for for what I have. Um, if if you. If you're just beginning in the area of generosity, if this is something that's new, then uh, I would say start small. Uh, if you've never given money or volunteered, start with something that you can accomplish. You don't have to give 10%. You can find a cause and give a dollar to it. Give $2 to it. Give something to it. And, and volunteer some time. Um, it also helps that what, whatever you give to, uh, give at the first of the month. Make that your first thing, just uh, as you have a budget, and you put that one at the top of the list, because what we, what most of us do is that we have a budget, and we have a list, and that giving is usually at the end, and then maybe we give it, maybe we don't. Depends on if we run out of, if we have more money than we have money. Uh, divert one specific expense for one month. Divert one a specific expense to a charity of your choosing. So find a, in addition to the church, find something uh, that you're passionate about, that you want to see uh, grow and develop and, and have a, a, a positive impact in the world. And then look at uh, some of the things that you do in, in your regular lifestyle. And it, you know, it could be something as simple as uh, eating out instead of being out however many times you do that, or if you do that, eliminate one of those and take the money that you save there and give that to that particular cause. Things like that help us get started in, in being that, uh, in, in the generosity lifestyle. Um, spend time with people in need. Rubbing shoulders with the poor just may change your impression of them forever. In other words, they no longer become those people over there, or why, you know, why are they like that? But spending time with them, getting, getting to know them. Now, we, we live on the southern edge of downtown. We live in the old Sears building across from the police headquarters. So, um, fairly uh, 
all, almost every day, I, I walk. So I walk from there and I walk uh, to Clydebourne Park and back. So that's about a five mile walk that I'm on. And so my friends kid me because they said, well, what do you see when you're going there? Well, I see business people, I see tourists, because we go through the convention center area. But you see a lot of street people, a lot of homeless people. And, uh, and usually, <laughs> surprisingly, those are the ones that when I, when I greet them, and I try to greet people as I'm, as I'm going along there, uh, they are the ones that respond most positively. And being able to then sit, I don't sit down and talk to them, but have it, uh, engage them in a, in a conversation as much as they are willing to be able to do that, you begin to learn some things about them. And you begin to see them in a totally different light. Um, quite honestly, most of them that I see are, um, uh, are usually either abusing drugs or abusing something or there are some mental issues, especially the ones who, they're not talking to me, they're, they're not really talking to anybody, they're just walking down the street talking. And, um, and so you, you realize that these are, are people that, that do need help and, and are things in which we can invest our resources, which is our time and our talent and our financial resources to be able to help them. Um, spend time with someone that you would identify as a generous person. Get to know them. Have a conversation with them. Find out when they begin to do that. What motivates them to do that? How can they do that within their life? Pick up some pointers from them. And then one of the things that, uh, that we strive to do is to live a, a more minimalist lifestyle. Uh, looking at, um, rather than having the next big great thing, what can we simply live on? There was a, a book I read a few years ago about a person whose goal was to live just with 100 items in their life. Uh, I thought, well, okay, well, you know, I don't have that many clothes and I don't have that. But then I started counting all the things that I have. Well, I, I zoomed past 100 before, you know, I could even think, before I got out of the closet. Uh, <laughs> much less got into the rest of the house with that. And so, so, so think about uh, how you can, can do that because the purpose of that, again, it's not self-denial, it's not uh, giving up things, but it's being really freeing yourself up to be, to be able to be generous so that your focus is not just on, uh, on yourself and, and what you can accumulate with that. Um, so here's some things that a study uh, has shown us that when we're able to let go of things that don't matter, we're free to pursue things uh, that really do matter. We have more time and energy. We have more money. We become more generous. We have more freedom. There's less stress in our life. There's less distraction. There's less comparison. But there's more compassion. Um, so as you think about how can you become more generous, the things I would encourage you to do is, and again, I realize we're here in church and, and this is not a stewardship talk, and so we're just going to assume that you at some level give something to help support the ministry of the church. But beyond the church itself, uh, uh, find something in which you can invest your time, your resources, uh, in addition to the church, to be able to give of yourself, to be able to help your fellow man. Because as John Wesley was talking about, as Martin Luther was talking about, is that our real goal as, as a Christian is to be able to have that kind of positive impact uh, upon our world. And rather than being, wringing our hands and talking about uh, how terrible the world is right now, um, what can we do within our life by being generous and being able to have that kind of positive impact that we have there? Uh, so, uh, Deacon Jazz said I had till about 10 till, I was about 12 till. Um, so, what 
Are there any questions or comments? This was not meant to, uh, this was really meant to be something to give you some ideas and some thoughts about how you can become more generous and however you want to apply that within your life. Um, you may be that person uh, that others need to go sit down with because of your generosity and to, to learn from that. Uh, if, if you fit into that category, be, uh, be willing to, to help them to be able to bring others in, into a generosity lifestyle as well. But it, yes, sir. I just uh, have learned through my learning to give that it's all about trusting God and His provision. And it's really helped me a great deal, and He has provided generously, just as I have it. But it's really just trusting and knowing that He will provide. And sometimes it doesn't look too good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't look too good, you're right. But, ha but having that faith. Yeah. which helps us grow in our spiritual life as well. Right. Yes. Well, folks, thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure to be back here. Great to see And I can't wait to, uh, to see that organ. That, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's fantastic. So uh, thank you all very much, Deacon.